they discovered upon their arrival was almost unspeakable. We are all evil in some form or another. I'm not guilty. <laughs> the dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. Some, if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. Hello! And welcome to the disaster known as the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. <laughs> I'm Janelle. I'm Vicky. We're sounding a little different, aren't we? Yeah, so we are kind of like doing a blast from the past and <laughs> recording from our homes. Uh, yes, not pandemic related. Not pandemic related, no. Our studio is currently under construction. <laughs> Our studio, i.e. Tiff's house. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So she has asked us to (laughs) record from home, which is... She said, fuck uh, off. I'm (laughs) under construction. Humbling. It's very humbling. It's also, (laughs) I got to say, it's a nice reminder of why we love Tiff. Why we have Tiff Mm -hmm. like to do this for us. We just come in and sit down. And now we have to, I'm like, the best. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, my laptop needs to update. Oh no, my microphone's not being recognized. You know, yeah. it's a fucking disaster. <laughs> we spent 20 minutes trying to figure out computer issues. So yeah. this episode really is dedicated to Tiff. <laughs> yeah, I started a half an hour early with <laughs> testing my microphone and I, I, we still started 20 oh, minutes late. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's... It's already been a morning. Yeah. We'll say. <laughs> so if this is your first time listening, a special hello to you. Um, I also just realized that this is the first time I've recorded in the apartment. So like, yeah, I'm in a bigger room with less stuff. It might be mm-hmm. a little more echoey. I don't know. Echoey, spacious. So yeah. just bear with us for the next couple of episodes. We promise we'll be back in the studio soon. Um, yeah, I'm back to my cu- closet, my beautiful closet full of vintage <laughs> I honestly gave half a thought to recording in my closet, but really, I can't move the desktop in there. It's just not going to happen. Oh, you should see my setup. I am sitting on my meditation mat with a BOSU, <laughs> which is a little thing you put under your butt to like uh, tilt your hips forward. And my laptop's on the floor. And then I have a vintage like vinyl kitchen chair in front of me with the microphone on it. So, yep. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. I'm on the floor. (laughs) Well, you guys didn't come here for good audio anyway, so it's fine. (laughs) Or a good podcast or a good story even. You came here for crime. Yeah. For true crime stories, which is what we got for you. Mm -hmm. Um, But first, let's head over to the newsroom. Okay, this week our news comes from San Jose, California, where a San Jose police officer, um, or I'm sorry, a an employee of the San Jose Police Officers Association, 20 years, he, y'all, the call was coming from inside the house. He was charged with um, uh, attempting to distribute drugs, including fentanyl, like a whole like fentanyl, like just ring. a block of it. <laughs> yes. Just pure yeah. fentanyl. So let me see. Joanne Segovia, who is the union's executive director, was charged with attempting to import illegal synthetic opioid drugs from over- overseas, specifically ver- valeryl fentanyl. You can see how oh, there's how, brands. I guess I don't. I don't think it's a brand. I think it's a type of fentanyl. Okay, there's types. It's of a fentanyl? type of syn- <laughs> synthetic. Like I don't know. I don't okay. know. It's part of a federal indictment. Uh, she says they were planning to distribute them in the U.S. This is all from ABC Seven. She says so. Segovia is 65 years old. She used her personal and office computers to order drugs and agreed to distribute them in the United States, like using your, you know police officers association <laughs> computer to order drugs online chill totally not traceable um no i mean definitely not the wisest decision mm-hmm. <laughs> but for real it's one of these it's like y'all just look inward look at yourselves <laughs> and maybe think what's going wrong here 
So they started following, uh, th- basically they started following this person says they had allegedly a pro- approximately 61 shipments mailed to her home from locations, including Hong Kong, Hungary, India, Singapore, they had intercepted some of the packages and she just continued ordering them. And anyway, that's, uh, that's that. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to move on to Netflix and kill where this week we are talking about, uh, Waco American apocalypse. I just watched this. So I, and we've talked about this a lot of times, like there are these big, you know, the heavy hitters, Waco, Jonestown, when you're talking about cults, Ruby Ridge, like that kind of stuff (laughs) that get done over and over and over again. And so when I see something like this, I'm not necessarily the most excited because it's typically like sort of rehashing everything that's already been said about whatever is happening. Waco was interesting because, of course, they claim to have never before seen footage. But honestly, the, it was the interviews with the some of the survivors. Yeah, actual Branch really, Davidians. The interviews were like what I think really sold this documentary. For yes. Me. If you don't know, Waco happened years ago. There was a compound in Waco, Texas. They are a offshoot of a Mormon sect essentially living in this little compound lots of guns atf comes in shooting the whole thing goes to hell compound sets on fire i mean there's lots of stuff in between deliberately or indeliberately on fire (laughs) oh my gosh Mm -hmm. uh depends on who you talk to (laughs) exactly so it was really interesting to me because they had these sort of like um it was almost like 3d digital sort of recreations that they did when they had these um, it's sort of like simulated drone footage, because obviously they didn't have that kind of shit then mm-hmm. um, that I think kind of made the layout of everything more understandable. But the inner, the people they had interviewing were um, David Thibodeau, who sort of like came in to, I don't want to say towards the end, but it, it, he like came in after everything was already set up there. Yeah. He was, Played by, uh, uh, what's his name? Rory Culkin? <laughs> Macaulay Culkin's the other yes. younger brother uh, in the yeah. TV series. I didn't think about that. Yeah, so what did, what did you think of this? I thought it was interesting. Um, it was a little strange to hear some of the stories from the perspective of the children that got sent out during the standoff. So that was interesting because it definitely made it sound like that kid, the woman who was a kid at the time, still believes in all the things that were happening there. Yeah. Well, like and the way she was talking, even the woman who was like a pretty much, I think she was an adult at the time that this was all happening was like, mm-hmm. yeah. And you her know, child got taken away. Yeah. Ki- yeah. 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 That one. Kids were adults at, you know, 13, 14, according to the scripture. And it was mm-hmm. like, yo, <laughs> because I do, I agree. There's still like a, like you can see there's still a lot of belief in all of this there. Yeah, for sure. You know. So that being said, I thought honestly, I think it's a worthwhile it's only 3 episodes. It's worthwhile if you are interested. I mean, again, it's if you know what happened, you know what happened, but it is the interviews that kind of yeah. sold this one. And they talk a lot about so they also talk to the surviving like ATF people Mm -hmm. Um, they also spoke with the woman who got her kid taken away. So they talk about the other surrounding stories. Um, they talked about the, the people who were trying to negotiate with them, which I think also is left out a lot. Um, so there's lots of, uh, tapes of the negotiation between David Koresh. Um, and I think it was the FBI that was doing the negotiating, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Mm Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's always that's always really interesting to me because there's um, there is this kind of side story of this internal battle between the FBI and the ATF that didn't really come out until later. But like the ATF's tactics for handling the situation were very different from what the FBI negotiators were attempting to do. And a lot of times non-existent tactics (laughs) from the ATF. Yeah, I would say just brash going in there without a plan is what it definitely feels like. (laughs) 
Yeah, the ATF was very action oriented. We'll That's say. a polite way of saying bull in a china shop. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Um, and the FBI was definitely like trying to take this more tactical approach, and these two approaches like butted heads constantly. Yeah. Um, to un- you know unfortunate ends. <laughs> yeah. Because I think you know had maybe those two. I'm not saying it would have solved everything, but might have avoided some of the mistakes not all of them but some of them yeah and like the someone was the entire thing started because someone had a big mouth and was like oh yeah we're doing a raid today yeah which is also not how like that's not how you do (laughs) that's not how you do that a raid is supposed to be secret (laughs) and that's how that's supposed to work you're not supposed to tell the mailman who's part of the group and then they go and, and then them. went back into oh my god yes <laughs> um anyway that's on netflix it's called waco american apocalypse this is that part of the show where we say content may not be appropriate for all listeners this will be i don't you know this is these are one of these topics that i'm very excited about so you know what are we talking about today <laughs> Well, you know me and how I hate people. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, Recently, you know, there were a lot of train crashes happening in Ohio, some chemical spills, contaminated waterways. So that was kind of on my brain. So I wanted to talk about uh, man-made disasters because I feel like we forget about all the repercussions of these things that might be an accident or might just be because somebody is not paying attention or maliciously, you know, does these things. And then we forget that it will be felt for years, decades even. So I wanted to look at some of those stories again. (laughs) I literally got a, like, a week ago, got a text message from Wani that was like, well, the city of Philadelphia just told us not to drink the tap water because it's toxic because of the um, the latex spill yep. in the Delaware River, mm-hmm. like all feeds into Philadelphia. And I was like, yep. Uh, what? <laughs> like, I, and they still I asked them the other day, I was like, yeah, so what's up with that? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Yeah, like, so I feel like Ohio, okay. Pennsylvania, Michigan, that mm-hmm. Rust Belt region really gets hit hard often and yeah. frequently. We've talked about other man-made disasters, and mine were always within that region, you know, Massachusetts a little bit too. Yeah. So there's something about the upper, like, eastern seaboard that uh, connects it to the, the beginnings of the Midwest where it's just fucked. <laughs> Yeah. And honestly, like, it's interesting that you bring that up because I do think it is a little bit of this um, striving for industry and Mm -hmm. really wanting to, like, make it happen there. Yeah, exactly. So moving from steel, what's the only thing left that you can manufacture in the United States? And that's fucking chemicals. (laughs) And doing it faster than anybody else, which also means, like, harder, looser, maybe not following regulations. Yeah. It's like... Cut some corners. Yep, exactly. There's not even corners. They're cut so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, they're just flat circle. lines. <laughs> <laughs> so for the disaster I wanted to cover, I actually wanted to leave the United States because, you know, we have enough disaster here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if we don't, don't worry, all get we'll cancer, be I'll be fucking shocked. <laughs> <laughs> So instead, we're going to go to another place that I'd love to visit. And um, although now I'm having second thoughts about that, uh, Japan. Uh Oh, (laughs) Oh, yes. Okay. Japan is beautiful. That's one Mm -hmm. of the areas. So I don't fantasize about leaving the United States very often. There's like three places. It's Italy, Japan, and the island of Guernsey. Don't ask. Okay. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> Those are the right three places that. that I think about. Not a tropical island, not anywhere super exotic. <laughs> Japan, <laughs> Italy, and the island of Guernsey. I mean, Japan's like kind. I mean, I think Japan is. I've always really wanted to go to Japan just because the culture is so different mm-hmm. from the US in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Like, the way people interact with each other, the way people interact with their environment. Like, it's all very, very different. Yeah. It'd be really fun. So we're going to take a look at a small village called Minamata. And Minamata is a fishing village. And it was established in 1889 as a village. 
Then it was redesignated as a town in 1912, and then officially became a city in 1949, right after the war. They're located on the southernmost tip of Japan, so closest to the mainland, basically. Um, the little inlet um, was mostly fishing, but in 1908, a chemical factory opened called Chiso Corporation. So this plant created chemicals for fertilizer, you know, rangings of industrial use, and for the use by the government during World War II. So they were creating chemicals for the government. Okay, as you do. <laughs> In 1932, the Chiso factory started producing, and I'm going to say this every conceivable way, but the right way probably, <laughs> acetylahyde. That sounds That's, good. I mean, that sounded pretty good. <laughs> acetylahyde. Um, they produced 200 tons in the first year in 1932 in their production. By 1951, production had jumped to 6,000 tons. And eventually it peaked production in 1960 at 45,000 tons. Gosh. That's so many chemicals. Yes. The factory, uh, their output was really between a quarter to a third of Japan's total production of acetylahyde. Oh, wow. So uh, they were producing a lot. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, chemical yeah. reaction used to produce this particular chemical um, is through mercury sulfate as the catalyst, so mercury. And a side reaction of this uh, kind of chemical reaction, it produces small amounts of a mercury-based compound called methylmercury. Now, in order to create this catalyst, it has to use water. And so the wastewater from this um, catalyst is dumped out, and it's supposed to be dumped out in a very specific way through a very specific treatment of the wastewater. But instead, the toxic compound metal methyl mercury was dumped into the Minamata Bay. Um. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I always feel like when it comes to these, like toxic chemical things mm -hmm. it's always the byproducts that they have yep they're like i issues don't like dealing with. it's like so I, it's like you're driving in your car and you just ate fast food and you're like i don't know what to do with this trash i'm just I'm gonna go chuck it in a river i'm just gonna chuck it out the window <laughs> right like you're like i know what i should do with the trash I should yeah. just like pull over, go find a garbage there, can. There are put very it in clear there. guidelines about the trash. <laughs> but you're like, oh, I just really got to get this out of my car. I can't have this bag in my car anymore. Chuck it all over. Is anyone down. looking? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's how I view uh, the treatment of waste products through chemicals. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the town was super poor before the factory settled here. Um, it was just a standard tiny town fishing village. But Chiso brought wealth and jobs to the area, as we hear many, many times when we hear cases like this. Um, and they had a lot of pull in the town, and no one knew that there were toxic chemicals being leached into the waterways. Oh my god. <laughs> now, when you ingest these chemicals, you will get mercury poisoning. Now, we've, oh, heard people, great. <laughs> we've heard people get mercury poisoning from eating too much fish before or not the right kind of fish. But really, it's more about where the fish is coming from and the water that the fish is living in and not the fish itself. Sure. Mercury poisoning can be extremely deadly if it's not treated, but it can be reversed if it's treated um, in adults mostly, not so much children. Children who get mercury poisoning tend to have lifelong effects, especially if it's in utero. Um, symptoms depend upon the type of mercury, the dosage, the method, and the duration of the exposure to it. But they may include things like muscle weakness, poor coordination, numbness in your hands and your feet, skin rashes, anxiety, memory problems, trouble speaking, trouble hearing, or trouble seeing. Wow. Yeah, so it can fuck that you up. <laughs> quite the list, yeah. Um, in the mid-1950s, the villagers began to notice something really strange in the town. Um, and this is actually like a separate story that was covered by someone um, in a book. And they were noticing that their cats were behaving really strangely and falling into the sea. What? So this was like listed in the news as mass cat suicide. <laughs> Oh my god, that makes me think of that, isn't there a dog, 
like a bridge that dogs jump off of? Yes, supposedly. Yes. (laughs) So some people thought that cats were committing suicide. They were like getting all wavy wonky and then just like pitching themselves into the seat. Oh my Um, God. (laughs) On April 21st, 1956, a five-year-old girl was examined at the Chiso Factory Hospital in Minamata. Now, this was a common thing in the United States during the Industrial Revolution where companies would have their own hospitals, doctors, etc., and this is really to keep any problems or issues in-house. So, mm-hmm. same thing. The physicians were really puzzled by her symptoms. She couldn't walk. She was having trouble speaking. And she was going into random convulsions. Two days later, her younger sister also began to exhibit the exact same symptoms. And she, too, was hospitalized. They saw that eight additional patients were having these symptoms. And they were put into the hospital as well. By May 1st, the hospital director reported to the local public health officer that they discovered some sort of unknown epidemic of disease attacking the central nervous system. Thirteen additional patients from the fishing villages near Manamata also were coming in with the exact same symptoms. Uh, One person died. um, And as time, yeah, just like randomly like convulsed to death. As time went on more and more people started to become sick and a bunch of people started to die. And it was becoming this really big issue and they couldn't figure out what the fuck was going on. Then they started to notice other environmental changes. So local bird life as well as domesticated animals started to perish. We're talking um, not just the cats throwing themselves into the seas, but we're talking about like dogs and birds. Just all of the the animal life on the island was starting to be affected. Crows were falling from the so- the sky. Seaweed knew- no longer was growing on the seabed near the coast. Fish were floating dead on the surface of the sea. Um, so they were realizing that there was something massive happening, not just to people, but to the animals and the environment. Oh, my God. I feel like I would be so <laughs> wigged out by birds just falling out of the fucking sky. Like, yeah. that would wig me the fuck out. It's bad enough when a bird flies into a window, but when it just like yeah. drops dead in front of you, you're like, okay, oh, isn't this oh. how like every Stephen King novel starts? <laughs> the birds, literally. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, we we have to figure this out. So the city government and various medical practitioners formed a committee to kind of figure out what's going on. And it's probably the most ridiculous, hilarious name I've ever heard a government put together. It is the Strange Disease Countermeasures Committee. <laughs> strange disease i like that yeah so this was formed at the end of uh may in 1956 the outbreak was starting to become national news and researchers from kumamoto university uh came to help with the efforts in figuring out what the hell was going on the kumamoto university research group was formed in august of 1956 and researchers from the school of medicine began visiting minamata regularly and admitting patients to the university hospital to have additional observation. Researchers from Kumamoto University also began to look at where people were located, and they realized that it was mostly families in the smaller smaller fishing hamlets within the area, and the groups of people were very much clustered together. So it wasn't widespread as people were initially thinking, but really in small cluster groups. Okay. Now, they began to look at the family's daily lives and what they did, where they went, what they ate, and they discovered that the food that they were eating was extremely common across all of the families that were suffering from this mysterious disease. Everyone was eating an absorbent amount of fish and selfish, which is what, it's what you do when you live on the coast, right? You just love the sea. Right. Now, scraps were often left out for animals to eat, leftover fish bones, shells, that sort of thing. So... They realized that a lot of these birds and cats and dogs were eating the exact same foods that the people were eating. Oh, okay. So they decided to test the waterways and the food supply. In the uh, kind of beginning, people were thinking that it was something that was spread between person to person. But then as things progressed, they figured it was something environmental or atmospheric. Yeah. So... During the time when they were trying to figure this out, the disease was eventually renamed Minamata disease. Um, So that's what you'll 
hear me talk about it as for the rest okay. of the thing. Um, on November 4th, the research group announced its initial findings. Minamata disease is rather considered to be poisoning by a heavy metal. Presumably, it enters the human body mainly through fish and shellfish. Now, it was clear that the water was being poisoned, but they were like, by who? Who could it be? Who could be dumping chemicals? Wherever could these chemicals be coming from? Oh, my God. Perhaps the giant chemical factory. No. The what? I've never seen that before. Yeah. So in March of 1958... A British neurologist named Douglas McAlpine um, suggested the Minamata symptoms resembled those of organic mercury poisoning. So the focus of the investigation switched to straight up mercury poisoning. So they were testing for mercury specifically. By February of 1959, the factory was starting to be investigated. The shore just away from the plant was tested for mercury And mercury was found in fucking everything. The water, the shellfish, the fish, the sludge that was on the shore, which apparently is a common thing if you're near a chemical factory that the out waste of water creates sludge. Ew. Um, But the item listed on the list of things that contain mercury literally said shore sludge. (laughs) Oh, my God. That was pretty hilarious. So here's the grossest part, I think, of the entire thing. The mercury was so dense in the area, and it was at such high levels that it could be classified as mineable, meaning that the, uh. the mercury was so thick that it was as thick as a mercury deposit in the earth. Yo, what? <laughs> That's so much mercury. <laughs> That is so much mercury. Like, if you think about now, people give you a lot of shit if you eat, like, tuna and stuff. Or, like, there's a lot of warnings about mercury and fish in sushi. But you'd have to eat that fish several times a day, every day, for multiple days before you would ever get mercury poisoning. Yeah. And it's because of the Minamata disease that there's... Japan is the reason why we have mercury poisoning caution on all of the seafood and shellfish because of this. Yeah. <laughs> that is wild. I had no idea. Yeah. So in November of 1959, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, um, they created a subcommittee called the Minamata Food Poisoning Subcommittee. And they did a separate investigation and they published their results. And it stated that Minamata disease is a poisoning disease that affects mainly the central nervous system. And it is caused by the consumption of large quantities of fish and selfish living in Minamata Bay and its surrounding areas. The major cause causative agent being some sort of organic mercury ca- compound. So in an attempt to undermine all of this research, the Chiso factory Uh, with other parties who are interested in, you know, the success of the factory, decided to create their own research group. And it actually included the Ministry of International Trade and uh, the Japanese Chemical Industry Association. They funded alternative research causing a little bit of confusion. And they were looking at alternatives to the, the causation of it other than chemical waste so the company was like we're gonna do our own report and then the government was like here let me help you with that and then like the regulatory body the association i'm assuming was like here let's also help you with so that. it was two other governmental agencies who were not with the original agency so these gotcha. were actually these were business and trade oriented okay uh subgroups so they weren't, it was more like, like, not a super PAC. What am I thinking of? Like, a, like you know, committees that go to bat for, like, tobacco and things like that. Like, the, yeah, like lobbying yeah, groups Yeah, that's almost? the word I was looking for. Lo- so yeah. they're more like lobbying groups. So the Ministry gotcha. of International Trade and Industry and the Japanese Chemical Industry Association are more like lobbying groups. They See, work- those names make them sound very official. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. <laughs> most lobbying yeah. group you know, names do sound official. And most of the people who work for lobbies are former government or business agents. Like, right. It's all connected. So these two groups, although they had associations with the government, they weren't necessarily governmental agencies. Gotcha. But they were the ones assisting and funding because they had skin in the game, right? Like the Japanese Chemical Industry Association, they wanted to make Japan 
like the preeminent exporter of chemicals in the fucking world, right? That's their goal. Yeah. And the International Trade uh, Industry Group, they were interested in exporting other things, not just chemicals. So it looks bad if you're like, oh, all of the fish around here is bad. So there goes the fish industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is a bad look. (laughs) Yeah. So they were kind of doing their own separate investigation and it was getting people confused because they were saying, oh, you know what? It might not be the mercury, um, but we don't know what it is. (laughs) So no definitive answers. Okay. So there was an organization also, the Minamata Fishing Cooperative. They were a staple in Minamata since the beginnings of the town becoming a city. And they were fighting constantly with the Chiso Chemical Factory since its fucking inception. They started, um, like, so the Chiso Factory, you know, was there pretty early on in 1908. So, like... They, the very first battle that they had with them was when they put the chemical in, chemical factory in in 1908. Then they did another lot, like lawsuit style uh, battle with them in 1926. And then again in 1943. So they were constantly fighting them. So they were yeah. really trying to, when this happened, trying to be one of the, you know, main headlining groups to start a lawsuit against the factory. Um There were so many fishing families affected. Fishing became banned in the area. Um, So not only was there health concerns and people dying and the environment was being destroyed, but it completely decimated the entire industry of that town. So, you know, there was no good way to kind of remedy this. And so the Minamata Fishing Cooperative was like, we need to get these people money because they no longer have a way of life. It's gone. Right. So in an attempt to start a compromise, the Chiso factory decided to install a new wastewater facility in 1959. They're like, this will work. This will help. This will stop it. Right. But it actually did not work. (laughs) Of course. In fact, (laughs) it was still the same exact output of mercury into the water And the wastewater facility did not treat it at all. Oh, great. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Thanks for all the help. (laughs) So during this time as well, they started to notice now that in maternity wards, doctors were saying that there was an exorbitant amount of children being born with really intense illnesses like cerebral palsy and MS. So now it was starting to affect generations who are being born. Which... You know that means it's been there a while because like that it takes a, it takes a while for that to like trickle into the birth population. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's not something that will happen tomorrow. At the beginning of the 1960s, they were really trying to um, stop the chemical factory and get legislation and to just stop things altogether. But it took a really, really, really long time. 1968 to be exact. My God. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't until 1968 that the Japanese government actually issued an official conclusion to the cause of Minamata disease. And they stated that Minamata disease is a disease of the central nervous system, a poisoning caused by long-term consumption in large amounts of fish and shellfish from Minamata Bay. The causative agent is methylmercury. Methylmercury produced in the acetylhyde acetic acid facility of Shin Nihon Chiso Minamata factory. It was discharged in the factory's wastewater. Minamata disease patients last appeared in 1960 and the outbreak has ended. This is presumed to be because consumption of fish and shellfish from Minamata Bay was banned in the fall of 1957. And the fact that the factory had waste treatment facilities in place from January 1960. Okay. So the government straight up came out and was like, yeah. it's because of... Yeah. So they're like, the people stopped eating fish from the bay. The the water started to be treated. But we know that the water wasn't actually treated. I think it's more because right. people stopped eating the fish from the bay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. Um, so shortly after this statement was uh, submitted, an arbitration committee was um, set up by the Ministry of Health and Welfare in April of 1969. It took a year to draw up a compensation plan. And the association to indict those responsible for Minamata disease, which is an actual title, also organized and they were instrumental in raising awareness and funds for uh, the the impending lawsuit. So 
this did go to trial. And at trial, people who were patients and their families of those who died, but most importantly, um, it was a lot of executives and employees and things like that who were being mm-hmm. put onto the stand that really kind of opened people's eyes. But yeah. one of the most dramatic testimonies actually came from a gentleman called Hosokawa, who spoke on July 4th, 1970, from his hospital bed where he was dying of cancer. Hosokawa okay. explained that he conducted experiments for the Chiso factory on cats, including the infamous Cat 400, which developed Minamata disease after being fed factory wastewater. What? He also spoke of his opposition to the wastewater output ro- uh, route and the additional um, wastewater treatment facility that was eventually put in in 1960. Hosokawa's testimony was backed up by another colleague who also told everyone that the Chiso factory officials had ordered them to halt their cat experiment in the autumn of 1959. Um, And if you remember, that's when shit started to hit the fan, where tons and tons of people started to get sick and go into the hospital. Right, right. Hosokawa died three months after giving his testimony. Wow. And a verdict wasn't passed down until 1973. The verdict handed down on March 20th, 1973, represented a complete victory for the patients of the litigation group. And this was what um, was kind of said at the end of the at the end of the um, investigation. The defendant's factory was a leading chemical plant with the most advanced technology and should have assured the safety of its wastewater. The defendant could have prevented the occurrences of Minamata disease or at least have kept it at a minimum. We cannot find that the defendant took any of the precautionary measures called for in this situation whatsoever. The presumption that the defendant had been negligent from beginning to end in discharging wastewater from its acetylhyde plant is amply supported. The defendant cannot escape liability for its negligence. Good. So in a final kind of wrap up here, (laughs) I say final wrap up. This is still an ongoing argument and discussion in Japan. Oh, my God. They calculated in March of 2001 that 2,265 victims had officially been recognized as having Minamata disease. And over 10,000 had received financial compensation from Chiso. So that includes families of members whose members have died. Mm -hmm. You know, (laughs) it's difficult because there are people who are sick and have diseases in their family now. And it's hard to directly tie that in because they can't, you know, if you test them, they don't have mercury poisoning, but it does affect your genetics. So in April of 2001, the Osaka High Court determined that the government's health and welfare ministry should have begun taking regulatory actions to stop the poisoning at the end of 1959 after researchers concluded that Minamata disease was caused by mercury poisoning. Mm Mm-hmm. So um, they also ordered at that time, after they realized that the Health and Welfare Ministry didn't do anything, they ordered $2.18 million in damages to be awarded additionally to people who were affected by this. Okay. You know, they're like, okay, we did an oopsie. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We did an oopsie. We didn't stop this. We didn't stop the poisoning. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) You know? Um. And then on October 16, 2004, the Supreme Court of Japan ordered the government to pay an additional 71.5 million yen in damages. Damn. So, you know, they were able to keep going and keep getting money for the people affected by this. Basically, by 2010, Chisa was paying 2.1 million yen monthly in medical allowances to people um, wow. who were affected by this. And that was more than 65,000 people who applied for this compensation. Wow. Yeah. So even after it was, you know, taken care of officially and it was settled in court, there was still effects being felt decades and decades after. And there are people who will continue to feel these effects for decades because of how much fucking mercury was being pumped into the water and the food supply. But that is the story of the mysterious Minamata disease. (laughs) 
Okay, so we are going to go right back into the United States. <laughs> oh, goody. <laughs> um, we're actually going to talk about one of the, I would say, probably more major uh, man-made disasters in the U.S. that I just never knew about. <laughs> like, it just is not something that has ever come up on my radar. But I want to talk about Love Canal. Okay. Also because the name is great. Are you familiar with this at all? I'm not. Oh my gosh. Okay. After looking at this, I was like, I'm kind of surprised I haven't heard more about Love Canal and like what happened. But we, it's going to go all the way back to 1890, mm-hmm. where this guy named William T. Love began planning to build this sort of ideal urban community, not in like a culty way, just in like a, you know... Uh, idealistic way of, Mm -hmm. you know, urban life um, on Lake Ontario in the Niagara Falls region that he claimed would also produce much needed hydroelectricity at the time. Um, Remember, this is the 1890s. Um, So the project was called Model City, New York. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> um okay <laughs> like which is like spot on mm-hmm. um so by 1892 this had changed a little bit to incorporate a shipping lane to bypass niagara falls so love got backing from these big banks in new york city and chicago and england and had gotten a ton of interest from steel companies and other manufacturers who wanted to build plants along the canal um, and one had actually finished construction in October 1893. Mm, okay. So Love Canal was born and Love began digging the actual canal while he started construction on the streets and the housing that would make up the community. Mm-hmm. Then the panic of 1893 happened. As it does. Uh, <laughs> as, it do- as it does and as it will. Mm-hmm. Uh, throwing the country into this like super deep depression. Most of the investors like abandoned the project. Things for love pretty much went from bad to worse when in 1906, Congress passed a law designed to preserve Niagara Falls after pressure from various environmental groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, the law made it illegal to actually remove water from Niagara Falls. Okay. So that coupled with... A second depression, the panic of 1907, <laughs> and the at this time there was like this development of long range power sources, so mm-hmm. using hydroelectricity but being able to like transport it farther, pretty much killed whatever was left of Model City, mm. essentially. Uh, Love had actually by this time had left the country. He left in like 1897. There was a corporation sort of running all of this, and he apparently went on to do some more of these types of schemes uh, overseas and then, like, came back to the U.S. and tried to do it again. But the Love Corporation pretty much sold the remaining piece of property in 1910, and the urban community and canal was pretty much abandoned. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, of the canal construction, only about a mile had been dug, approximately 50 foot wide and 10 to 40 feet deep. No one, I mean, it was, like I said, it was left to be abandoned. So nobody was maintaining the channel. It just was left to just sort of gradually out. fill with yeah. water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As holes becomes, do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When you, <laughs> if you don't fill a hole, something will fill it for you. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it basically got treated as like a lake uh, and children started using it for like swimming in the summers and ice skating in the winters. And that was until the 1920s when the city of Niagara Falls decided to repurpose it as a landfill. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Can't just have it filled with water. Got to fill it with land. Of course. Obviously. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Uh, So Love Canal was bought for this landfill purpose until 1952 when it was finally closed. Now, as you can imagine, like industry around this time was booming. There's tons more stuff being Uh, manufactured, produced, and then thrown away like plastics and rubber and chemicals. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I see a theme here. I see a theme. (laughs) Yeah. Ours, we have very, I feel like very, very similar. Mm -hmm. It's it's, it's a tale as old as time. Yeah, it really is. (laughs) (laughs) So enter the Hooker Chemical Company. Ooh, what an unfortunate name. (laughs) I knew you would love that. Mm -hmm. 
So the Hooker Chemical Company was looking for a place to dump its chemical waste and eventually received permission to dump the waste into Love Canal. So the canal was drained and lined with clay Mm. before Hooker placed a ton of, not a literal ton, there was lots of tons, but (laughs) a a literal literal shit ton ton (laughs) of 55 gallon drums along the bottom. Five years later, Hooker um, bought the actual canal. So before they just had kind of this deal with the city, they actually bought the canal and uh, converted it into a 16 acre landfill. They would then use the site for chemical dumping until 1952 when they ceased use of the canal after it became apparent that Love Canal was going to be used for construction. During the 10 years that I'm they sorry. used the canal for like, dumping. I'm making faces and you can't see yes. it. <laughs> I know. I don't have I'm Janelle. Just like, we just have on. audio right now. So I'm like, <laughs> you got to describe your describe your disgust, Janelle. I'm just, uh, my brow is so furrowed. <laughs> <laughs> so during the 10 years that they had used the canal for dumping, Hooker discarded 21,800 short tons of chemicals, mainly including, quote, Caustics, alkalines, fatty acids, and chlorinated chlorinated hydrocarbons resulting from the manufacturing of dyes, perfumes, and solvents for rubber and synthetic resins. So, like, all of these things together? Yeah. That's, okay. Straight up. (laughs) That's a a lot. Yeah. The chemicals were buried 20 to 25 feet deep and then covered with a clay seal to prevent leakage. So around March 1951, the school board of Niagara Falls City School District began putting a proposal together to purchase land for development of a new school. And after receiving the inquiries, the folks at Hooker said, yeah, I mean, if they're talking about building a school there and like developing this land, we should probably stop dumping, which is I mean, these kinds of deals take a lot of time, too. So yeah. like, that's <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> oh my god you're gonna be like that for the next like 25 minutes oh great i can't wait <laughs> mm-hmm. so they were like let's like stop dumping if they're gonna develop meanwhile mm-hmm. there were some conversations happening within hooker about why this might be a good idea in the road to love canal by greg e colton and peter n skinner they recount some of the correspondence between hooker's vp bjarn kleisen in-house counsel ansley wilcox ii and president rl murray regarding the sale of the land with murray saying quote the more we thought about it the more interested wilcox and i became in the proposition and finally came to the conclusion that the Love Canal property is rapidly becoming a liability because of housing projects in the near vicinity of our property. At a school, however, could be built in the center unfilled section with the chemicals underground. Mm-hmm. We became convinced that it would be a wise move to turn this property over to the schools, provided we could not be held responsible for future claims or damages resulting from underground storage of chemicals. End quote. <laughs> Mm, goody. <laughs> Do you see the wheels in motion here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Hooker agreed to sell the property to the school board for $1, provided they were able to add a liability limitation clause to the deed. So the school board uh, agreed, <laughs> which is also just like baffling to me. Yeah, yeah. School board agree- I mean, it's a dollar. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, that tracks. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard this before. So the school board agreed and signed the documents in April 1953 with the following clause added, quote, prior to this is going to be a lot of contract jargon. So just stick with me. Okay, I'll try my hardest. (laughs) (laughs) Prior to the delivery of this instrument of conveyance, the grantee herein has been advised by the grantor that the premises above described have been filled in whole or in part to the present grade level thereof with waste products resulting from the manufacturing of chemicals by the grantor at its plant in the city of Niagara Falls, New York. And the grantee assumes all risk and liability incident to the use thereof. It is therefore understood and agreed that as part of the consideration for this conveyance and as condition thereof, 
No claim, suit, action, or demand of any nature whatsoever shall ever be made by the grantee, its successors or assigns, against the grantor, its successors or assigns, for injury to a person or persons, including death resulting therefrom or loss of or damage to property caused by, in connection with, or by reason of the presence of said industrial wastes. It is further agreed as a condition hereof that each subsequent conveyance of the aforesaid lands shall be made subject to the foregoing provisions and conditions. (laughs) So basically, (laughs) they were like, we will literally never be held liable for Mm -hmm. any of this because we wrote it in the deed. and That's how contracts work. (laughs) Yep. I don't know. That's right. That last line is like, that's some, I got to say, like. That's some really good lawyering. That is some very good lawyering. (laughs) That's some corporate lawyering for you. Oh, for sure. So Hooker believed this pretty much made it the responsibility of the school board and any owners thereafter to protect people on the property from chemicals that might be there, absolving them of any potential liability literally forever. Once they had the land, the school board began to develop the land, which of course included construction. (laughs) Even though they had been warned about where they intended to place the school, they had been warned by Hooker, like, you might not want to put it here because that's where all the chemical waste is at. Yeah, that makes sense. They were like, (laughs) right? Like, here's a map of all of the landfill. Here, This area circled is chemical waste. Like, just don't put the school there. So you mean put the school right there? Yeah, that's what they heard, pretty much. (laughs) Uh, you mean because right they here? decided <laughs> to ignore what they said and they began constructing the 99th Street School in the precise location where they were told not to build. Yep. <laughs> now, during construction, crews discovered two dump sites filled with 55 gallon drums. So they went back to the board and basically said, yo, it is not great. To, it's like not a great <laughs> idea to build here because we don't know what other kind of waste is down there. So yeah. they moved the site 85 feet north of where they had planned and then moved the intended kindergarten playground from where it was planned because it would have been built directly on top of a chemical dump. That's totally safe for kids. They'll bounce back. (laughs) They're young. They're young. So construction was finally completed in 1955, seeing 400 students in its halls. It was one of multiple schools that had been built in the area, including the 93rd Street School six blocks away. Meanwhile, a 25-foot hole crumbled, exposing toxic chemical drums to rainwater, which in turn formed puddles that the kids played in. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The remaining land uh, that was owned by the school board and unused was sold off and subsequently used for housing constructions by private developers, as well as the Niagara Falls Housing Authority. Now, once again, Hooker came forward during the sale of the land for development to again warn developers that it wasn't suitable for anything that involved underground facilities. So you're talking like sewer water, like Mm -hmm. you can't do like this extensive underground digging. But they also were not in a position to, like, stop the sale of the land for whatever purpose it was intended. So they were just like, hey, we're just popping in here to remind you guys. But, like, you know, you live your truth. (laughs) Yep. So construction on the new development of a mixture of low income and single family family homes began in 1957 while they were constructing constructing part of the sewer systems. Crews busted through the clay protective layer, exposing the toxic waste beneath it and allowing it to escape through rainwater seepage, eventually making its way into the canal. Oh, God. (laughs) Mm -hmm. This is like Toxic Avenger. Like, (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) True. (laughs) All you need is a little crack and everything goes to hell. Yeah. Now, some of the land that was being built on was not part of the school board sale. And so... The canal concerns were not related to the to the residents there. Like they didn't have the same information as everybody else. So mm-hmm. um, there wasn't like any concern or monitoring for the waste that was underneath and the clay covering under that section of the development began to crack. This combined with construction of the LaSalle Expressway trapped groundwater from feeding back into Niagara River and instead backed up into puddles of strange oil or colored liquids into people's basements and yards. Oh, God. Yeah. So it is a concern. (laughs) It 
it's a concern that it would be getting into the river, but like arguably worse that it's just straight up at people's houses. Yeah. <laughs> By 1970, the Love Canal community was thriving with new residents flocking into the area. Uh, in total, 800 private houses and 240 low-income apartments were construction, constructed with more planned. Uh, it really was this like burgeoning area of industry with shopping and easy access to schools and blah, 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 blah. And also chemical waste. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As previously mentioned, residents noticed that there were some weird liquids in the area <laughs> and for years had been like complaining about black fluid that flowed out of the canal as well as strange odors in their yards and playgrounds. It wasn't until 1977 that the city decided to hire an outside consultant to look into pollutants in the area. This Mm -hmm. came after a heavy winter brought 33 to 34 inches of snow, which then melted and then raised the water table and in turn raised the contaminants like dioxin. Oh God. So in the spring of 1977, the state departments of health and environmental conservation began collecting air, soil and groundwater samples, which as you might've guessed showed some very troubling results. Mm -hmm. Toxic vapors connected to more than 80 compounds were found in the basements of many homes in the first ring of housing directly adjacent to Love Canal. Yes, okay. <laughs> Soil analysis showed the presence of over 200 distinct organic chemical compounds. Mm-hmm. Other chemicals had seeped into the ground, including benzene, chloroform, toluene, dioxin, and various kinds of PCB. At least 12 of these chemicals found are known carcinogens. It was cr- like the amount of there's a um, great this will be in the research cancer. Links. <laughs> yeah, literally, this will be in the research links, but they have like uh, tables of all the chemicals and like what they are and what they do and all that stuff, because there is literally so many that they found in these soil samples that they had to put them in a table. Now, meanwhile, the reporters got wind of the situation unfolding in love in the Love Canal area and began their own investigation going door to door to speak to residents in the area. The health surveys they conducted found many unexplained illnesses, including epilepsy, asthma, migraines, nephrosis and higher than normal rates of birth defects and miscarriages. Hmm. Reports about the canal and the chemicals found there were being they began to be, get published around 1976. But it was sort of like this initial spark. And then it was kind of forgotten about uh, for two years until 1978, when reporter Michael Brown began his investigation and reporting. Now, Brown seemed to be uh, more of an issue because he was encouraging the residents to form some sort of like protest group, which eventually drew the ire of Hooker Chemical, who threatened to sue. They had these very like public sort of media blowouts between Brown and Hooker Chemical. Mm -hmm. Brown became somewhat of an expert on toxic waste, eventually writing the first book on the subject, Laying Waste, the Poisoning of America by Toxic Chemicals. Congressman John LaFalse took up the cause as well because Love Canal was in his district. um, And he attempted to encourage city, state and federal officials, as well as Hooker Chemical to act. But he was met with resistance and apathy and no one really wanting to like do anything about it. They were kind of it was very much like this is a made up problem. (laughs) Of course they did. (laughs) Yeah, this is not don't look over there. That's a made up problem. Now, it wasn't until 1978 when President Jimmy Carter proclaimed it a federal health emergency and ordered the Federal Disaster Assistance Agency to help the city deal with Love Canal that the wheels on this started turning. Mm. It was the first time in American history that federal emergency funds were used on something other than a natural disaster. Almost immediately, they built uh, trenches to redirect the waste to sewer and sealed off the sump pumps to people's homes so that it would stop backing up into like people's basements and yards. That's so crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Two years later, in 1980, Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or as it's better known, the Superfund Act. 
Now, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, the Superfund Act, quote, provides a federal superfund to clean up uncontrolled or abandoned hazardous waste sites, as well as accident spills and other emergency releases of pollutants and contaminants into the environment. Through CERCLA, EPA was given power to seek out those parties responsible for any release and assure their cooperation in the cleanup. It also created a national priorities list that sort of provided a short list of priority sites for cleanup. Love Canal was the first location that was added to this list. And I can't help but think, you know, as you sort of started off this segment, you said, you know, there's been a lot of fucking spills and trade derailments of like, Mm -hmm. I I can't help but think Superfund is going to be getting its uh, workout this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's just crazy. We'll see. Maybe. I mean, (laughs) yeah. Always possibilities of other things going awry, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, I'm sure you're wondering about the residents of the area. What's up with them? <laughs> Did they die? I Did they die? They're or? all dead. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, back when uh, the news reporter Brown showed up and began calling for the residents to form protest groups, that effort was largely headed by a woman named Lois Gibbs. Now, Gibbs lived in the community, and her son began attending school in Love's Canal in September 1977. September. By December, he had developed epilepsy, asthma, had a urinary tract infection, and had a low white blood cell count, all of which were later attributed to the chemical waste. September to December. Like, Gibbs would learn from Brown about the community being built on top of a toxic waste dump and rally the residents to investigate the health concerns of their community. The group called on city officials to investigate, although nothing was done. Later, Gibbs found out about waste in an adjacent canal, and the organization spent the next two years working to prove that Hooker Chemical, which at this point had come, they had been acquired by Occidental Petroleum, They were trying to prove that Hooker Occidental was responsible for the extensive health problems in the area. As you probably would have guessed, the homeowners were repeatedly ignored by government officials and Hooker Chemical, which continuously claimed the chemical dump had nothing to do with what was going on in the area. Okay, okay. Sure, 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 sure. (laughs) Yeah. Your basement sludge? That's not us. (laughs) We ain't be sludging. (laughs) (laughs) Now, once the reporting on the chemical dump came out, New York's health commissioner at the time, Robert Whalen, visited Love Canal saying he believed it was an emergency. Uh, he uh, Health emergency. Um, he told people to avoid going into their basements and avoid fruits and vegetables from their gardens, which sort of fr- freaked people out because they were like, well, we've been eating food from the garden for years now. Yeah, exactly. Like, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Whalen also urged pregnant women and children under two to evacuate immediately. What? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Straight what? up, like, get out of here. Oh, God. The evacuation process began in earnest two days later with the federal government relocating some 800 families as well as reimbursing them for the loss of their homes. So, yeah, they had they ended up having to pretty much evacuate the entire immediate area around Love's Canal, Love Canal. The state and federal government worked together to use $15 million to purchase the 400 homes closest to Love Canal so that they could be demolished. Now, what is left in this story? (laughs) Are you curious about if like, I mean, Hooker Occidental ever had their comeuppance? I mean, yes, but also I'm kind of afraid to know. (laughs) Yeah. So they um, did have a lawsuit brought against Hooker on Occidental by New York State that alleged the company knew of the risks when it dumped the hazardous waste into the canal. Mm-hmm. Attorneys for Occidental claimed that the risks from the dump site had always been exaggerated. And and this, I'll be honest with you, th- to me, like I am not on board. Don't get me wrong. Don't get it twisted. I do not support hooker accidental for the chemical spill. <laughs> okay. okay. Let me just make that clear. Here. Okay. I do mm-hmm. feel like this is a very interesting legal argument from a legal perspective. So the other argument that accidental's attorneys were making was that the company's actions could not be measured 
by what is now known about toxic waste, claiming that at the time, the disposal processes they were using in the 40s and 50s were state of the art. Hmm. So they did do the sort of clay um, barrier was like standard practice at the time. And it wasn't until like, I want to say maybe like the 60s or 70s that they actually started using a lining when they are covering and trying to seal in like waste, toxic waste dumping. It wasn't until later that they started using a lining. So they're basically like, you can't be here in the nineties and be like, you guys should have known this in the forties when there's no possible way that they could have known that it wasn't like the most, it was just like standard operating procedure at the time. Mm -hmm. So I do think that's a really interesting legal argument. Yeah. The trial lasted around 10 years in total. And in 1994, a federal district court found the, uh, found that accidental had been negligent, but not reckless in the disposal of waste and sale of land. Occidental was then sued by the EPA and agreed to paying $129 million in restitution, $3.5 million of which was used for a state health study. There were also also multiple lawsuits from uh, the residents in the area that were settled pretty quickly thereafter. Mm-hmm. Most of the residents chose not to return to the area. Um, they, I, I want to say, I remember seeing it was like of some 900 families, maybe 90 returned to the area. Mm. The... Most most of the area was demolished, honestly. The area determined to be the most toxic was reburied. They actually like had to rebury it with a thick plastic liner, clay, and dirt per current standards. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It wouldn't be until 2004, 2004 that Love Canal was actually removed from the Superfund list, although the actual cleanup had completed a few years earlier. But you're still talking like 2000. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For the cleanup to be done for something that started in, um, they started, they ended dumping in 1952. So, <laughs> uh, it took over 21 years and $400 million to complete the cleanup. Okay. Well, that's, that's the, not that much in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> I mean, not money, but like time, I feel like time wise, like kind of a lot but a lot of it isn't even like i do feel like that a lot of that time is not spent on cleanup like the actual physical cleanup of it it's like the hemming and hawing between companies and governments trying to like who's doing what getting contractors doing all this other bullshit like yeah yeah anyway so that's the story of uh love canal and the creation of the super fund which i didn't even know was going to be in there and then i was like oh look at that this sucked, but like did something. Also, the idea of something called Love Canal just really cracks. Yeah, me. that is like absurdist. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you know what? I think if we were to have a note to end on, I just want to be like, do better. That's what I want to say. <laughs> just do better, is, guys. You know, like, just try harder, guys. <laughs> yeah, you just got to do a little better than what you've been doing. So on that note, uh, (laughs) before you decide to bury a bunch of toxic waste in your backyard. Don't bro. Maybe check out. (laughs) Yeah. Don't do that. But maybe check out this podcast. (laughs) Hi, I'm Lainey host of the new podcast. We're all just pretending it's a podcast that has elements of dear Abby with a twist of post secret. Every episode I'll read listener questions and provide advice and insight as a friend. My own pod friends will even join in and offer their advice on parenting, relationships, and even give you really bad advice on purpose. Since we all have secrets to share, there'll also be a segment focusing on letting the skeletons out of your closet. If you're looking for advice or want to share a secret, head to allpretendingpod.com. And remember, we're all just pretending here. All right, Janelle, that has been our episode. What do we got coming up? Do we have things? I mean, I'll keep saying this until Can we talk about things? Yeah, we have an event in November. More info to come. It's in Rockford. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Same as as last time. There will be a festival (laughs) with Haunted Rockford that we will participate in. And more details and things will be coming out soon. In case you didn't know, there was like a massive tornado event um, that happened recently. 
And so yeah, some plans might have to be rearranged. <laughs> but it's happening yeah. in November. Uh, spaces might be different, but... <laughs> yeah. This, we are recording like three days, two days after a couple tornadoes swept through the area. So yeah, yeah literally Got a lot of phone calls. Rockford and Belvedere were hit. So pretty hard. Um, <laughs> so we'll see so we'll, uh, where it'll be, but it'll be in November. <laughs> uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you can find more just like this at bad taste podcast.com. Uh, you also it unsure of our website. <laughs> yeah. I realized just then that I haven't talked about it in a while. <laughs> it was like, what is the website? Yeah. Badtastepodcast.com where you can find our donate and merch pages if you want to support that way. Um, but otherwise, I think that's all we got. Yeah, that's pretty much all I got. So on that note, our sound and editing is by Tiff Fullman. Our music is by Jason Zakshevsky, The Enigma. That's really good. <laughs> Tiff is going to thank us for that later. Or she's going to get really startled because she didn't expect it. Um, this has been the, <laughs> the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. We will see you in two weeks. Goodbye. Goodbye. It was as if a wave of evil washed over this town. We are all people we're in some form or another. I also just realized I don't have any of my buttons. I should have gotten the buttons while I was... Oh, well, just to say, put it in post. <laughs> yeah. You gotta put the... Wah, wah, wah. We can just make the noise. <laughs> I'll do it. Wah, 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 wah. So wah, wah, wah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Cut that. Chop it. Cut it in. Chop it. Screw it. Put it in. <laughs>